Good afternoon. We are about to begin our uh, fifth session of the second academic uh, day of this uh, fantastic conference. I'm Iska Harani and I'm privileged to chair this uh, afternoon. The title of this afternoon is From East and From West, Jerusalem Through Christian Eyes. Well, we do mention East, Orient, or West, Occident, but the three lectures have come actually much more from North than from the Orient, but still, it is considered for uh, the eyes of the Westerners as the Orient, and we are very much looking forward to hearing your views of um, what Jerusalem is like in the eyes of uh, Georgian, Armenian, Russian, and other lands that you can contribute to your talk. We would like, like to continue now, and I would like to invite Zahuri Avedis Hakobian, who is um, a professor of uh, art history. Dr. Zahuri Hakobian is an associate professor at the Yerevan State University at the Department of History and Theory of Armenian Art. Professor Hakobian specializes in Armenian Byzantine, Armenian Georgian, and Armenian Chalcedonian culture. She teaches on East Christian art, Byzantine, Armenia, Georgia. Um, she received her MA and her PhD from Moscow State University after M. Lomonosov, Department of History of Art. She is the author of more than 60 articles and book reviews in academic journals. She lectured and presented in more than 30 academic conferences in Europe and South Caucasus. She's been awarded a postdoctoral research fellowship from Alexander Onassis Public Benefit Foundation, and her, among her publications are Lumi di Sapienza, Miniatura Armena, Armenian Early Medieval Sculpture, Genesis Forest, and so on. I would like to invite uh, Professor Hakobian to talk to us about the reflections of the Jerusalemite realities in the Armenian early medieval sculpture and small architectural forms. Haramechek. Um, dear colleagues and friends, first of all, I want to uh, thank the organizer of this uh, wonderful conference and this opportunity to be here, to come to Jerusalem, because uh, now Jerusalem is in the core of my research, researches, so <laughs> thank you very much. <coughs> the context of the Armenia with the Holy Land, especially with Jerusalem, have a long history. The existence of the Armenian early Christian monasteries in Jerusalem and the Holy Land from fourth century onward has been investigated by some outstanding scholars such as Ahav Nuni, Garagin Hovsepian, Michael Stone and others. Recently, the book on the Caucasian archaeology of the Holy Land by Dr. Jana Chekhanovets was published, which presents uh, the Armenian, Georgian, and Albanian communities in the Holy Land between the 4th and the 11th centuries. All these materials indicate that the Armenians were well aware of the Jerusalemite realities, and namely the significant Christian shrines and churches. In addition to the very fact that the uh, penetration of the new faith into Armenia from the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire, the second and third centuries from Syria and <coughs> sorry, Asia Minor, and the presence of Armenians in the Holy Land, there were other events in the Christian history that connected Armenia directly with Jerusalem and thus received reflection in art and culture not only in Armenia, but the South Caucasus in general. It is about the dramatic events of 614 when the Sasanian, uh, Sasanians captured Jerusalem and the Christians lost their most important relic, the True Cross. The war between Byzantium and Iran thus gained a universal Christian significance as a struggle for the recovery of the Holy Cross. But in the context of my presentation, the important point is that Armenia became a direct participant on this of these historical events. 
<clears throat> the fact is that the Byzantine emperor Heraclius, determined to take revenge on the Sasanians, arrived in Byzantine Armenia in, uh, to the territory adjacent to Iran, as he considered Armenia as a bridgehead for the attack on Ctesiphon, the capital of the Sasanian Empire. Uh, these events uh, attested in the Armenian and Byzantine sources in the history of Sabaeus and a uh, chronographia of the Theopolis. And even more strange that we rarely address these episodes in Armenian and Christian studies. In my presentation, I want to concern the very historical events <coughs> through contemporary monuments. I'm sorry for my... <clears throat> the first monument under the discussion is the church in Meren, the cathedral of the Saharuni princely family, but on the, uh, built on the right, ba right bank of the Ahurian Gorge, now in Turkey. The church is dated to the, uh, by the inscription to the uh, 639, and this photo was taken from the side of Armenia. Uh, the church has three entrances, but only two of them, the western and northern, are decorated with multi-figured reliefs. A monumental composition of the western portal occupies two tires. The tympanum has a white arch with a wine scroll carving on it, and there are two standing archangels in the tympanum with a careful carved wings and rich drapery. In their hands, we uh, can see the rose and medallions with the images of cross. On the lower part, on the lintel, six figures are, uh, are presented. Christ with the apostles, Peter and Paul, in the center, and the church patrons, the bishop Theopilos and prince of princes David Saharuni on the right, and the prince Nerses Kamsarakan on the left. We know their names for sure as they are mentioned in the building inscription. But however, it is more important that the Byzantine emperor Heraclius himself is mentioned in it as the supreme ruler and he named as happily victorious king. Moreover, according to the 10th century historian Hovanes Drashanakertsi, the church in Mren was built by the order of the Heraclius himself. The sculpture composition on the western facade of Mren with the pronounced Byzantine iconography, I mean the composition of the giving of giving the law in the center, Christ with two apostles, uh, and the donators by the sides as prayers, could be considered one of the earliest donor compositions in the South Caucasus. In the context of my presentation, however, the composition of the northern portal is significant. It is much smaller, and the scene is conventionally called the adoration of the cross. On the northern lintel, we can see three figures. In the center, there is a small, bold figure that raises a cross on a long pole, and two more male figures approaching him from the sides. Uh, the figure on the left, who wears a secular garb, has just dismounted, and the clergyman on the right holds censer, and he is depicted against the background of the symbolic tree of life, grows from the triangular mound, perhaps symbolic rock of Calvary. The scholars have pointed out that the composition of Mren lacks an exact analogy in the Christian art, and therefore Sirar Peter Nersisian marked it as hapex, which means something known in one copy only. And that is why the composition was interpreted differently. The scholars saw here a funeral procession, a scene of a foundation of the church, the act of adopting Christianity, etc. But the most plausible inter, um, interpretation of the sculpture is that of Nicole Thierry, who identifies uh, this scene as the restitution of the true cross and its exaltation in Jerusalem by the Emperor Heraclius. Christina Maranci and I share this interpretation, but with some ad uh, amendments. The agreement with Nicole Thierry is due to the information known from the contemporary sources. It is said that when the emperor with his army arrived in Armenia, the Armenian princes joined the emperor, 
and a little later Georgians did the same. And finally, Heraclius defeated the Sasanians and returned the true cross to Jerusalem, which happened on 21st March in 630, and it was celebrated throughout the Christendom. It is also considered that the emperors associates, <coughs> namely David Saharuni, the patron of the church in Maren, joined the solemn procession of the return of the life-giving cross to Jerusalem. While going through Armenia, Heraclius, together with Armenian princes, laid foundation for some new churches, mainly on the Armenian-Byzantine border. Uh, for instance, in Sopapur, in Gugark province, and another big church was founded near Amida, not far from the upper Mesopotamia, again uh, according to the historical sources. Uh, it is also interesting that churches in the name of the cross appeared in the South Caucasus precisely after the very events. We can mention, for example, the church in Zarenja in Armenia, St. Cross Monastery in Yeregnadzor, again in Armenia, uh, the church of Jvari, a famous uh, church in Georgia, and the name is translated as cross, a St. Cross Monastery near Erzurum, and all them have been built during the first half of the middle of the 7th century. There are different uh, approaches uh, about this uh, dating of Jvari, that's why I put this uh, question mark. But let's go back to the composition on the northern facade of Maren. According to Nicole Thierry, the Emperor Heraclius is depicted twice in the center, a small figure, and on the left. Uh, a figure of a secular person, and the sensing, uh, sensing um, figure at the right represents Modestos, the patriarch of Jerusalem, who got the relic from uh, Heraclius. Tim Greenwood expressed nearly the same idea, characterizing the scene as, uh, quotation, an overtly imperial theme without any obvious Armenian connotation. But the unique nature of the image and the lack of the corresponding Christian prototypes uh, force us, some of my colleagues and me, not to uh, connect directly the composition of the north lintel with the imperial iconography, but to see here the mixture of the Christian and the local history. This is why Christina Maranci identifies the secular figure on the left as David Saharuni, uh, and the clergyman on the right is the Bishop Theopilos. That means the, uh, that here are the same persons that have been referred to in the inscription. This could make sense if we had only the composition at Maren. And let me remind you that Sirar Peter Nezisian also identified it as a unique scene. However, everything changed with the emergence of a similar scene on the slab from Corp. In the Corp relief, a spolia inserted into the wall of the later church, a large cross is presented in the center and three figures approaching it from the left. The left part is damaged and we can see only the outlines of the figures, but as I uh, examined it in situ, so uh, believe me that here we see the three figures. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. Damage. Yes, let's go on. It is clear that composition of Mren and Korb, and Korb coincide, especially it concerned the three figures worshipping the cross as well as the palm tree as the symbol of the paradise. The fact that Mren's composition is not unique and it is not directly related to the church in Mren makes me interpret the figures differently. I'm also sure that Heraclius is in the center, as he is uh, the main uh, protagonist of the scene. The figure on the left is David Saharuni, and here my opinion coincides with the version of Christina Maranci, not only because David was the patron of the very church, uh, I mean the Church of Maren, but first of all because he was the ruler of the country and the vicar of the Byzantine emperor in Armenia endowed with the high dignity of Kurapalates. It is also important that Syriac sources 
Chronicle of Michael the Syrian and uh, Nestoria and uh, History of Nestorians, yes, mentioned Armenian David who fought for Heraclius, and it was he that found the true cross in the uh, palace in Ctesiphon. And finally, the third figure uh, on the right must have been Catholicos Yezer, appointed by Heraclius as the head of the Armenian church, uh, just uh, uh, th th at that time, in 630. Moreover, according to the sources, uh, according to Sebeos and Armenian Chalcedonian uh, work, Narratio de Rebus Armenia, the Cath uh, Catholicos made his commun communion with the emperor in the Greek Orthodox rite in Karin Cathedral in Armenia, and in honor of this event, the Church of the Holy Concility was founded at this site. Joint depiction of the Byzantine emperor and the Armenian dignitaries uh, was possible only in the case of absolute convergence of the political and religious interest of the two countries. In the case of flourishing of Armenian Chalcedonian church and the fact that the event of the restitution of the two crows were assimilated <coughs> by the Armenian people as part of their own history. And the last important feature concerning the two sculpture, uh, com sculpture compositions is that the figure situated in the center, right by the cross, whom we believe to be Heraclius, is smaller, and it needs ex explanation. In her essay on the reliefs at Meren, Christina Maranci brought a Latin narrative of the restitution of the true cross to Jerusalem, which contains a peculiar detail. At the culmination of the triumphant return of the cross, the gates of Jerusalem suddenly closed in front of Heraclius and only opened again when he changed his imperial garb for sackcloth. The emperor could uh, only enter Jerusalem in a submissive guise, humble like Christ. Yeah, Christina Maranci also reproduces the only known image of the same plot, the miniature of the Mont Saint Michel Sacramentarium, dated to the 1060, which shows how first the emperor pos uh, prostrated and humble, then the emperor entered Jerusalem holding the cross. Uh, Christina Maranci points out that the relief at Mren, let me add also uh, the relief from Corp, are probably the earliest preserved depictions of this story. As an evidence of this parallel, she, saw, uh, she uh, shows the uh, architectural relationship between the church in Meren and the Golden Gate of Jerusalem through which Christ entered the Eternal City. The double doors of the gate, now blocked, are topped with heavy molded arcades and there is a large roundel with profiled frame and raised central <laughs> boss. On Meren's north and west facade, there are similar massive arches that appear below uh, profiled oculi above the arch tympana. Christina Maranci follows other scholars in admitting that the Latin text derives from the Byzantine sources, which is confirmed first of all by Stepan Borgehamar, who prepared a critical edition of the Latin text of the Reversio Sanctus Crucis, there is very reason to think that this lost Greek text was well known among Armenians as well uh, because early uh, medieval Armenia was famous for its, uh, Gre for its Greek translations, translation school, and this justifies the depiction of the emperor as small as submissive. At the same time, this can be explained by the word of the Saint Augustine. The gates of the kingdom of God are small. To enter, you need to bow or be child. <coughs> uh, without de deviating from this story, let me move on the other group of the monuments. On the territory of Armenia and neighboring Georgia, there are th freestanding monuments of the small architectural forms which were erected in the open air uh, next to the churches. There are four-sided or tetrahedral stila, so-called memorial columns and uh, monumental crosses up to two meters. 
Among them, stila make up the majority and are richly decorated with ornamental and figurative reliefs. Because of the lack of time, I cannot go into details and talk about all the aspects of the mentioned monuments, but only highlight what concern my topic. Uh, the stila from the, uh, uh, form a separate independent group of monuments that is not uh, known in other Eastern Christian countries. On the other hand, their architectural and compositional features closely connected to the late antique and early Christian art. Thus, I it is important to understand the time and background of emergence of the tetrahedral stella. First of all, it should be emphasized that the four-sided stella of Armenia and Georgia are undoubtedly presented a common cultural phenomenon in the South Caucasus, and Nicole Thierry is the only scholar who mentioned it. The next key question is the date of these monuments. In general, it can be said that Armenian scholars always try to date the stila to earlier time, to the 4th, 6th centuries, while their Georgian colleagues date the monuments to the 5th and 8th centuries. Uh, since I have a study on the date issue of the stella, I should just summarize and <coughs> say the, uh, that based on the iconographic and stylistic analysis of the images, as well as the character of the ornamental motifs, tetrahedral stella uh, should be dated to the early or middle 7th century. <coughs> the compositional features of the stila with the principles of the order construction give every reason to look for the origins of these monuments in the late antique and early Christian art. For example, the triumphal columns erected by the Roman and later by the first Christian emperors, the latest of which erected in 608, as symbols of their glory and successful military victories. They are known in Rome, Constantinople, Alexandria, and Jerusalem. We can see the depictions of such an early Christian columns on the floor mosaics on one of the squares of Jerusalem of the Madaba map, on the mosaics of the churches of Lyons and St. Stephen in Umm al Rasas in Jordan. <coughs> we can see the reliefs of such columns on the Syrian uh, uh, stele now in the Louvre Museum, a column crowned with a cross is carved on the Basilica of Kalpluze in Syria, and finally there is a depiction of such a column on the wall of the church in Ezzani in Georgia. It is quite clear that the general idea of these monuments came from the late antique and early Christian art, and the cross on the top of the stela gives the idea of the triumph and the power of the faith. <coughs> However, in the Christian East, two more very significant columns were known on the holy site. Such columns make the place of the uh, baptism of Christ on the Jordan River, and we know about it uh, thanks to the <laughs> thanks to the testimonies of the medieval uh, pilgrim, pilgrims of the sixth and uh, eighth centuries. This is why very often in Byzantine painting one can see a pillar crowned with a cross in the scenes of baptism. However, there are later examples and in early medieval Armenian sculpture, in, the, in particular on the stele of Odzun and Bertazor, the second stele now is in Bilisi Museum, uh, you can see <laughs> oh, I lost the. Mm -hmm. the this, these are these. You, the the this is uh, in Armenia, this is in Georgia, Georgia Museum. <coughs> and if I, uh, if I did the, um, and we s uh, see here the columns in the uh, river. And if, we, if I date the st uh, stila to the beginning of the 7th century, then the reliefs also belong to this very period. Actually, these are the earliest examples, but you will not find this information in any handbook on Byzantine or Christian iconography, since these examples are not known. Today, these are the earliest such compositions. Another 
such column den uh, denoted the Golgotha, and it is well known, so I will not uh, dwell on it. Uh, one more detail of the still of Armenia and Georgia are the ar architectural models that uh, sometimes crown the pillars and thus give us a source uh, as a source of inspiration. These architectural models are of two types. On the still, uh, stila from Ozun, there are several examples in, from Armenia, and Handis and Lamazigara uh, stila from Georgia. We can see the models of basilica. They have horseshoe arches and vaulted ceilings. Sometimes they are double story. <coughs> And in the case of Ozun model, they are paired uh, to uh, models, to basilicas. We can see the entrance and the niche, and this niche is for relics, supposed. Yeah. The other... Mm -hmm. Uh, the, uh, the other type reminds the uh, Tempieto with four columns by the corners. They are fragments from Parpi, and we can compare them with the depiction of the Holy Shrine in, the, in other monuments of the time. For example, the Tempietos in the miniature or the famous ampulla from the Holy Land. It is more than clear that these models repeated the, t the rotondo the Rotonda and the Martyrian Basilica in Jerusalem, and their re relationship is definite. Uh, let me just add that the context, in yes, I'll skip this part, and one more detail. The monumental cross of Dwin exactly repeated the cross on the Byzantine coins of the time of Heraclius, and it got the name of the uh, Victoria's Cross. And summarizing, I want to say that during my research on the stella, quite unexpectedly, another side of the four-sided stella was discovered. While we were mapping these monuments, we found out that the stella had been erected not everywhere in Armenia and Georgia. For example, in Armenia you can see Hachkars, uh, famous cross, uh, cross stones, everywhere. But uh, these stella and columns not uh, only... Uh, Columns only in just the sev several uh, places. And among these uh, 15 provinces of Armenia, you can uh, find them in Artsakh, Sunik, Ayrarat, and Gugark. And in Georgia, it's Kvemo Kartli and Shida Kartli, Central and South Kartli. Uh, and when I uh, connected these places, we got a road that miraculously coincides with the return route of the emperor in the South Caucasus. Uh, we know about this route of Jer uh, uh, to Jerusalem from Armenia, uh, from Byzantine source and Armenian sources, and at one time Professor Manandian restored this route based on them. And then the last question, so all these uh, peculiarities, uh, the relations with the Holy places in Jerusalem and the time when the stila appeared in Caucasus brings an idea to connect them with the Holy Land and the very important event of the time, the restitution of the two crows to Jerusalem in the first half of the 7th century. Thank you very much for your attention. So we are now uh, moving next to the neighboring country, and that is Georgia. And we're very happy to host with us Dr. Katevan Asatiani. Um, she was um, educated academically in Tbilisi State University in the Department of Classical Languages. She earned her PhD in Old Georgian Language and Literature. And um, she has been working since 2011 and until today in the National Archive of Georgia and is heading uh, the scientific uh, committee, the scientific department of National Archives of uh, Georgia. Um, her fields of interest are manuscript studies, Georgian manuscripts abroad, archives, antiquities, old Georgian literature, uh, Georgian liturgy and hagiography. She has authored and co-authored several monographs 
And I must say that um, personally, when I was inquiring about you, I heard something which sounds incredibly lovely, and that is that thanks to you, your National Archive turned from a dusty warehouse to a place of study which is dynamic and active and preserving your cultural heritage. So gratitude for that. Please, I invite Dr. Katevan Asatanyani. First of all, I have to say that uh, the Jewish community has uh, long resided in Georgia, dating back to ancient times. A prominent aspect of Georgia's cultural heritage involves a well-known narrative that links this community to the arrival of Christ's robe in the region through their representations. A quite renowned is uh, the narrative surrounding the messianic lineage of Georgian kings, which enjoyed great popularity during the Middle Ages. Uh, to the uh, okay. uh, uh, to the people of Georgia, Jerusalem held uh, utmost significance as the epitome of uh, divine sanctity, paying homage and offering prayers. They were considered uh, uh, tantamount to experiencing heavenly uh, uh, realms. Georgia is a small country situated in the South Caucasus, maintained enduring connections with the most influential cultural and religious hubs during the uh, prosperous period of the Middle Ages. This fact finds ample substantiation and the multitude of materials present in Georgian temples, uh, manuscripts, historical documents, and the various other sources, including the repositories of the centers where Georgians actively participated. Currently, the influence of Georgia in a prominent location such as Jerusalem, Mount Athos, Cyprus, Constantinople, etc., has gained significant recognition and uh, extensive scholarly attention. Extensive literature has been dedicated to exploring this topic with uh, further studies anticipated in the future. This uh, connection between Georgia and uh, these locations is evident through the pilgrimage undertaken by Georgians to sacred sites the establishment of cultural and architectural contributions, the general donations originating from Georgia, and the possession of these sanctuary artifacts within Georgia. However, it's uh, worth noting that the examination of this final aspect remains challenging and less thoroughly investigated. Throughout the uh, centuries, Georgian monarchs, nobles, and religious leaders have made numerous generous contributions to both Georgian establishments abroad and sacred sites in general. These contributions typically consisted of uh, monetary donations, uh, religious artifacts, and manuscripts. Additionally, they donated immovable or movable assets within Georgia, such as churches, lands, vineyards, and even the labor of peasants, uh, with the uh, resulting income allocated to the intended recipients. It's worth noting uh, that uh, these recipients were scattered across a vast geographical expanse. Uh, the nature of these relationships varied across different historical periods and circumstances. The following um, report focuses uh, exclusively on the possessions of Jerusalem in Georgia. Uh, throughout centuries uh, of uh, cultural relations and the exchange of the nations, Georgia has been linked of, to Jerusalem. However, the establishment of uh, land ownership of the Jerusalem Cross Monastery in Georgia can be traced back to the latter half of the 16th century. During this period, the Greek Patriarchate commenced its uh, activities in Georgia with the aim of uh, acquiring serfs. Consequently, the Georgian churches monasteries in Jerusalem were vacated by Georgians and came under the control of the Greek Patriarchate. Subsequently, the Greek Patriarchate gained prominence as the uh, rightful owner of the monasteries in Georgia, surpassing the serfs in importance. Uh, the Monastery of Cross of Jerusalem, constructed in the 11th century, holds great significance as a cultural and religious hub in Georgian history. Initially governed by the Greek Patriarchate of Jerusalem, it came under their patronage in the 18th century, granting them control over its operatings, 
oper operations, including access points. However, the terminology surrounding the monastery became muddled over time. Around the early 19th century, the Georgian term father of the god, Juris Mama, was replaced by a new designation which uh, persisted with a slight variations until the year, early 20th century. This new title uh, referred to the archimandrite of the Greek monastery of the Holy Sepulchre, who managed the Greek Jerusalem monastery's properties in Georgia as well, and so on. The administration of the assets owned by the Georgian uh, Monastery of the Cross in Georgia was primarily uh, entrusted to Archimandrite, specifically appointed by the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. In uh, 1801, the Russian Empire conquered the eastern region of Georgia and subsequently other parts of the country met the same fate. By uh, 1811, the autonomous status of the Georgian church was revoked and it came under the governance of exars dispatched by the Russian Empire. The arrival of the new conqueror heralded a paradigm shift in governance resulting in significant alterations encompassing the regulations pertaining to tax collections and distribution. Consequently, every legal document that substantiated the property rights of the natives necessitated revision under the auspices of Russian authorities. Naturally, there were also issues con concerning the offerings uh, sent uh, to various holy sites abroad, such as Jerusalem, Mount Athos, uh, etc. These problems were observed in both East and West Georgia, and they resulted in a partial loss of their intended purpose, conflicting with the new rules and regulations. The Archimandrites themselves faced similar challenges. Even prior to the evacuation of the autocephaly of the Church of Eastern Georgia, during the reign of Anton II, the Catholicos of East Georgia, Archimandrit Benedict, the administrator of the Jerusalem property in Georgia, composed a letter to Ivan Gudovich, the chief ruler of Russian chief ruler of Georgia. In, uh, in the letter, he mentioned the difficulties uh, encountered by Greek Archimandrites in collecting uh, their taxes in recent years. Archimandrit Benedict appealed for the reinstatement of the suspended regulation. From the outset, a conflict emerged between the uh, synodal con counter, Russian, uh, uh, this was the uh, Russian churches of Georgia in Meriti and the Greek Archimandrites. Following the evacuation of autocephaly in Georgia, specifically in Tbilisi, the newly established synodal counter made the decision to select the re uh, re residence of the Greek Archimandrite as its own dwelling in the heart of Tbilisi. This residence was located opposite the Sion Cathedral, Cathedral, specifically within the courtyard of uh, uh, cross church and policy. This move provoked a strong displeasure, resulting in letters and complaints from Archimandrite Benedict. Similar issues were encountered by Greek Archimandrite Matthew, an intriguing correspondence between Exarch of Georgia Theophilactus Rusanov and Archimandrite Benedict sheds uh, lights on this matter. The Exarchos insisted that in exchange for vacating this residence of the Greek Archimandrite, they should reimburse the ex uh, expenses uh, incurred for rep uh, repairing the house. Conversely, the Archimandrite demanded that the Exarchos pay rent for the four years during which he resided in the house. This conflict attracted the involvement of the subsequent chief ruler, Alexei Yermolo, who even sought complete control over the Archimandrites' activities, including their income, uh, expenditures, uh, construction projects, and trade affairs. Additionally, he proposed that nationalization of uh, properties belonging to Jerusalem as well as Athos and other entities. According to his proposal, all income generating from these sources should be deposited into the treasury and uh, subsequently uh, remitted to the Patriarch of Jerusalem in this specific case. Subsequently, it appears that the Archimandrites regained possession of their residence. This is evident from the fact that in 1887, the uh, 
Uh, designated address of the Archimandrites Trust, Alexander Solomonidis in Tbilisi, was recorded as follows Jerusalem Street, 5th District, near the Church of, of the Holy Cross. As a result of this new situation, conflict among various parties became inevitable. From a tax, 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 uh, taxation standpoint, local residents found uh, themselves with dual ownership. Uh, ex uh, exacerbating the already challenging social, uh, sh social backdrop. In an effort to mitigate this issue, Archimandrit Mitrofane presented a document issued in 1776 by King Solomon I of Emirates, this is the uh, west part of Georgia, stipulating examination from state taxes for uh, peasants affiliated with the tomb of the Savior. The matter, matter was uh, deliberated by a representative of the imperial government. However, it was ultimately decided that these peasants would not be exempt from the state taxes. Consequently, during this period, they were required to pay both the tax for the tomb of the savior, based on the old document, and the taxes to the imperial treasury in accordance with the new regulations. Greek archimandrites frequently expressed uh, uh, grievances regarding the violation of their rights. These complaints revolve around issues such as local uh, encroachment on their lands, non-payment of taxes, lack of respect, and harassment, among others. Conversely, the population facing dual pressure also voices their complaints. They assert that the Archimandrites deprive them of their basic necessities, uh, forcibly event, uh, evict uh, them from their homes, engage in physical altercations with individuals individual peasants, and uh, so on. Most of these uh, complaints originate, originate from the uh, village of Dirby in composing with religious and tax-related concerns. The resolution of this matter by the Russian rulers was a, a leg, uh, lengthy process. As previously mentioned, the Russian officials initiated efforts uh, from the outset to transfer the responsibilities of the Greek archimandrites. Eventually, based on official record, the Russian government assumed control of the ownership of the Saviour's tomb and other sacred sites in 1873. According to reports from Russian uh, officials, this decision was influenced by the uh, negligence of the Greek archimandrites in managing the state, their lack of familiarity with local laws and customs, and the language barrier. The administration uh, of Jerusalem, Mount Athos, Mount Sinai, Cyprus, and other locations in Georgia were consol uh, consolidated under a single entity, and a new position was established uh, known as the Overseas Greek Monasteries Estate, managed in Tbilisi, Governorate, uh, which was filled by Russian officials. At least three individuals, namely Sulhanov, Pirmenov, and uh, Pirmeni, are, are mentioned in the 1876 and 1877 documents as having held this position. The Archimandrites of Mount Athos, Mount Sinai, and Cyprus gradually departed from Georgia with the Archimandrite uh, sent from Mount Athos, formally transferring the donations in Georgia to the uh, Russian rulers. The Archimandrites of Jerusalem, on the other hand, uh, continued to be present in Georgia until the early 20th century. Although their autonomy was uh, significantly... Um, uh, sorry. <laughs> the, Archimandrites <laughs> the Archimandrites of Jerusalem, on the other hand, continued to be present in Georgia until the early 20th century, although their autonomy was significantly um, curtailed and uh, they were not granted independent authority over Jerusalem's property. Since 1874, uh, business trips of Russian officials have been organized to visit states and assess the current situation. In the Empire's territory, it was necessary to establish one's own government and temporary government within the church. As a result of police uh, uh, reports, often include information about the Department of Greek clergy from Georgia or their activities extending beyond the property of the Saviour's tomb. Uh, 
complaints uh, originating from either the Georgian or Greek side remains uh, uh, unresolved and are subsequently transferred to a different sphere. Consequently, both the uh, distressed Georgian peasant and the Greek Archimandrite find themselves at a uh, disadvantage. The Russian government uh, declines to uh, acknowledge this uh, inheritance and address the uh, prevailing issues. Since 1834, Georgian churches have adopted a uh, tradition previously unfamiliar to local uh, customs. The knowledge of uh, this tradition originated from Alexander Galician, who received it uh, from Tabor Archbishop Eurotheos and uh, shared it with the imperial administration. According to the ancient uh, practice observed in the Greek church, collections boxes known as piggy banks were to be established in Georgian dioceses for gathering offerings dedicated to the Savior's tomb. The imperial de decree uh, specified that uh, these piggy banks were to be placed exclusively in revenue-generating temples. They would be opened on a monthly basis, and the funds collected annually would be sent to Jerusalem. Throughout Georgia, specific temples were uh, designated to house uh, these piggy banks, referred to this uh, Russian word Krushka. Additionally, designed uh, well-regulated uh, <coughs> storehouses were established to ensure uh, meticulous uh, supervision of the funds uh, received from the piggy banks or seen by uh, responsible individuals. Uh, there are uh, numerous documents within the archival files uh, that uh, referred archival files uh, that uh, refer to the funds collected from piggy banks across all regions of uh, Georgia. Frequently, the population uh, faces barriers to making donations, primarily uh, because they lack uh, awareness of uh, alternative donations uh, methods or face uh, financial hardships they previous to them from generating cash income. Uh, during the era of the Russian Empire, the Patriarch of Jerusalem would uh, dispatch Archimandrites to oversee the immovable and movable assets of Jerusalem, whose uh, residence was situated in Tbilisi, specifically within the premises of the Father of the Cross Cathedral. The Archimandrites' uh, responsibilities encompassed uh, the, encompass the supervision of religious uh, services in Jerusalem's temples, regulation of uh, commercial establishments, management of uh, lands, peasants, and other uh, resources across various regions. Conversely, the population populace was uh, obligated uh, displaced to the uh, no, non-existence of the Georgian state at the time to fulfill tax payment and demonstrate uh, reverence towards the Archimandrites. Beginning in the 19th century, uh, there um, arose a question regarding the transfer of control and uh, accountability for all these uh, properties to Russian officials. Uh, uh, information regarding several temples uh, um, associated with Jerusalem was documented until the 19th century. We know that uh, Metochis of uh, Cross Monastery of Jerusalem in Georgia were uh, five or six churches, large churches. Uh, the primary purpose of these temples was, the, uh, was uh, uh, to support the Georgian Monastery of the Cross of Jerusalem and the Georgian community residing there. It uh, should be noted that during the late Middle Ages, all of these temples came under the ownership of the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. That's all. <laughs> Thank you, and I'm sure that your meticulous work about papers concerning the church and the taxes and the money and the documentation, all of that is very valuable, but in the city of Jerusalem, you know, sometimes documents don't really bring you to any final solution. When you said something about dual ownership, well, Jerusalem has multiple ownership. 
And so, well, the Monastery of a Cross is definitely a representation of a very, very troubled relationship here. Georgia, Russia, Greece, and others. Thank you for that uh, very big work that you've done. So we have a few minutes for questions. And um, I know we have some real experts here on these issues that we just heard. So anyone has a question? Please. Uh, I have Would you come forward so that the uh, can hear you? I have a question for uh, Lydia uh, Krakowskaya. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, the, the travel of Abu Daniel is very spread and there are some 150 manuscripts you mentioned. So I am sorry that I don't know uh, more. In, I, I, would, uh, I would like to know more in detail um, what, uh, where the manuscripts are uh, dispatched and uh, in what context and from which times also they were preserved it, if, if the success was continuous or uh, if there were some uh, peaks and <laughs> downs you know in the in the in the popularity of this of this uh, uh, work thank you Thank you for the question. Well, I, uh, I must say, first of all, that I didn't really go into the textology. Uh, most of the earliest copy we have dates to 15th century. Then, since 15th century, it was numerously, numerously copied. And what is interesting, what I found interesting, is that there is, um, there is sort of one, um, well, original text. Then, there is the original text with the glosses on margins, and the research showed that these are taken from Epithanius. So it's sort of a combination of Epithanius the monk and Daniel. Then there are other copies, uh, later ones, uh, I think it's like 17th century, 16th, 17th century, that sort of um, try to edit Abba Daniel. For example, Abba Daniel is really emotional. Um, and they either try to omit his emotions or they try to enforce them. Like he would say that Mount Tabor is beautiful and they will add beautiful, marvelous, um, excellent, and sort of, <laughs> you know, you know, uh, all, all sort of, all sorts of things. So, so actually, uh, what Leonid Andreevich uh, might help me that when um, the uh, Palestinian exploration um, uh, Orthodox Pravoslavny Palestine uh, Orthodox, society. Orthodox society started publishing the pilgrim text, so the first edition was actually Abba Daniel, and there they made the first sort of textology. Then they translated it into French, and then sort of, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so yeah. And I would, I would add that in, um, I don't know if it's pre-Israel or in Israeli times, uh, travelers' accounts were translated, but not fully. So there was no full Daniel's account, but sections. And obviously the section of the Holy Fire was translated. And I think this is what brought him popularity among people who are interested in uh, travel accounts. Um, any other uh, questions, please? I have a question for Professor Hakobian. Since you show quickly among the reproductions or evocations of the Holy Sepulchre, this structure, I think there's a newly found structure from Arzach, from Vashar, or Bachar, Bachar. And I was wondering whether, because it looks different from the other uh, structures you, you showed, is this more like the top element of a stele or a kind of model of the Holy Sepulchre, like the, I don't know, the Narbonne uh, 
architectural model. This one. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Bacci, for the question. Yes, uh, mm. again, I don't know where is it. Of course, you are right. This is the top of the stele. Uh, I, I, I thought that uh, it, it is cl clear, but uh, maybe I, I have to detail. Uh, yes, it's uh, not a separate uh, model of the uh, church or a basilica, but just a top of the stele. Sometimes this uh, stele, uh, they uh, have this model and on the model uh, cross freestanding cross yes yes they are open in um, in the in the models from palpi also they are open this is like san pietro and here here Place for uh, uh, place for uh, the cross, for the uh, arm of the cross. In Ozun also, this is the top of the stele. This is also uh, a broken part, but also the top of the stele. Any last uh, question? Please. Excuse me, may I add to this? Uh, maybe I did not understand right. Uh, did, did I understand this is the place where the uh, relic was uh, positioned, located? And uh, the origin uh, or the usual no uh, model of the top is like this. This open uh, architecture and the arches, or how this is a, sp a special model. How 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 can I combine? Of course, I will well, explain. explain. I will ex explain, of course. Uh, let's go <coughs> here. You see this stele. Sometimes they have these models on the top. Yes. And uh, concerning uh, the structure, of course, here you see only the niche, but it is not open like here. This is just uh, really like Tempioto, open from all the sides, but this is not. This is um, like more like basilica, and only in uh, Ozun, not uh, in the case of any uh, these models, but in Ozun we have this niche, special niche, and uh, it considered that the relics were kept here. Because uh, again, from the sources, Byzantine sources, early Christian sources, we know about such a tradition. For example, the uh, column in Constantinople it was described where the relics were kept and the, the special procession came to this column to venerate and uh, so I think this is a, a reflection of such a uh, maybe tradition, early Christian tradition. Okay, I think by now we have to call it a day. We were visiting um, 
textually and architecturally and artistically. Um, those three uh, places, three lands from where far away pilgrims came, uh, cared very much for the city. And basically from now, you can walk literally from here to the Metochion, Gat, uh, Metochion Malsaba that uh, you mentioned, uh, obviously to the multiple Armenian sites and not only to the Monastery of the Cross, but to the multiple Georgian inscriptions that we have scattered around the city and it's all within a, a walk, short walk from here. So it's wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for holding on until that very last session and we will see you tomorrow, right?